Thank you, Kai uh, Herlock. Wow. Um, Minister, can I first of all, before I even get into the legislation and what I was going to say, I've listened to him most of the speeches here tonight. And I have to say that even those who were formally opposed to this referendum taking place, or formally opposed to the legislation, have all, bar one, in my opinion, recognise the will of the people on the 25th of May. And it is very unfortunate that there are still some within this chamber who use terms during the debate on this legislation to suggest that people, and I quote, didn't understand what they were voting for or were stupid is grossly inoffensive to the electorate. And I reject it. I canvassed my constituency, as I'm sure other TDs canvassed their constituency. And we met people who were for and against the removal of the Eighth Amendment. I believe it was a very civil debate on the doors. I met more people who did not make up their mind or who had no clear preference um, before meeting canvassers, who were open to either voting for or against, who were engaged with the canvassers on both sides. And I believe that the vast majority of people who went out and cast their votes on the 25th of May did so from an informed position. And they were informed in a number of ways. They were informed through the Referendum Commission. They were informed through the debates that took place on TV and radio. They were informed through the canvassing teams for and against the proposal. So I just find it incredible that some TDs would insult people by stating that they were stupid or that they did not understand what they were voting for. And I think they should reflect on that. I want to particularly mention Deputy Butler. She made a contribution here tonight, and we all know Deputy Butler's position prior to the referendum. And she was very firm in that position, and she still believes, I mean, her position hasn't changed in terms of her beliefs, but she came into this chamber tonight, and in my opinion, she gave a speech um, which was very difficult for her. You could see it was very difficult for her. Um, but just the type of leadership that she has shown tonight in this debate, I think, is to be welcome. Because she has come in and she has said that she accepts the outcome of the referendum. She has difficulties with what is being proposed, but she is going to support the legislation. And I think that needs to be recognised, because all too often, some people who were opposed to this referendum, you know, were criticised because they were opposing it for, in some people's opinion, maybe for the wrong reasons um, or for ill-informed reasons. But for somebody to come in here who campaigned against it and to say, I accept the will of the people and I'm going to support the legislation, I'm going to work constructively with the government to try and pass the best legislation possible, I think should be commended. The other thing I want to say, Minister, is in relation to a number of deputies who have called for pre-led scrutiny on this bill. And there is a slight contradiction in what they're saying. Because on one hand, they're saying that we should have pre-led scrutiny on the bill. That it was, it's such an important piece of legislation and that it would be uh, beneficial to have that period where the committee would look at the health committee, uh, as it would be in this case, would look at that during a pre-led scrutiny. The reason you look at pre-led scrutiny, from my experience in this uh, dial anyway, is to ensure that what's being proposed um, is good legislation. And you look at all of the pros and the cons in relation to that. 
But I think this is slightly different because we actually had the general scheme of a bill published during the referendum campaign. So people knew, in my opinion, exactly what the legislation was going to look like. OK, you can say word for word what it was going to look like, but I think in fairness to the government, they published the general scheme of the bill and they have stuck to that. They have stuck to the general scheme of the bill um, and, of course, you know, during the course of the, the legislation passing through the Oireachtas, there may be amendments. They're not going to be fundamental amendments that change the general scheme of the bill. And even the general scheme of the bill, when it was published, differed from the Oireachtas report, because particularly around the three days, Minister. So just to get back to TDs who uh, are opposing this legislation, and it seems to be TDs who have difficulties with the legislation, who are demanding the pre-led scrutiny should have taken place, are the very same TDs with the same breadth who are stating that they are going to hold the government to account to ensure that what was proposed in the general scheme of the bill is not going to be changed. So, in my opinion, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm going to demand that the general scheme of the bill is adhered to, but we should have had pre-led scrutiny to see if we could change it. So, it, there's just a slight contradiction there in relation to that. Um, Minister, I sat on the Eighth Amendment Committee um, and I have spoken of my own personal uh, beliefs uh, growing up and where I got those beliefs, uh, as I'm sure many people, you know, they learn uh, certain principles from their parents. My parents were um, pro-life, they were opposed to abortion in all circumstances, um, and growing up, I have said this previously, um, I would have shared those views. But I now know looking back as a 46 year old man to the 20 year old person I was 20 odd years ago that while I firmly held those beliefs and you know, I at that time really believed in what I was taught through my parents, I now know with all of the information I have gathered as a legislator and from meeting, um, from meeting support groups, advocacy groups, from meeting medical professionals, from sitting on the Eighth Amendment Committee, from the last dial when we discussed the um, Protection of Life During Pregnancy Bill, I now know that that 20 year old me was ill informed. I did not have all of the information and my views and my beliefs were not based on facts. And the view that I have come to, many people have said to me, um, you've been on a bit of a journey. And I remember saying to one woman at the time who I'd met um, during the course of the campaign, um, I met her at a door. She was one of those women who had to travel to England to secure a termination. And I remember she had been following the Oireachtas Committee very closely and she had known my own personal position going back a number of years ago and how my views had changed. And she said to me, you've been on a journey and I thank you for that. And I remember saying to her, and I didn't say it to her flippantly, I, I genuinely meant it. I said, the journey I've been on is nothing compared to the journey that hundreds and thousands of women have been forced to take because of the Eighth Amendment. And if I have been on a journey, and that journey ensures that no other woman has to take the journey that they have taken, then I have absolutely no regrets in supporting this legislation. Absolutely none whatsoever, Minister. Just to talk about our own party uh, position. I mean, it's well known that there are differing views within our party as there is every other party. Um, and I actually am very proud of how our party conducted itself um, in the lead up to the referendum. We had a, a very uh, robust internal debate. Um, 
and the out workings of that debate was for everyone to see. It was held at a public Ardesh. The Ardesh was open to the media. There was no one bullied into silence, as has been suggested here tonight. Nobody was forced to take a position against their will. Everyone had an opportunity to go to our Ardesh to speak openly for or against what was being proposed and then abide by the decision. And that is what happened, and that is on the record. I would also say, and I might get into a slight bit of trouble for saying this, but what the hell anyway, even our party position, the same as this legislation, Minister, even if it is enacted in the morning, there will unfortunately still be some women who will have to travel. And I think we need to recognise that. I'm not saying we have to deal with it in this legislation because we can't, because we gave a commitment to people in terms of the general scheme of the bill. But even if this legislation was passed, there are still women who will be forced to travel, and we need to recognise that. So we still have a way to go as a society, as we have as a party, to recognise that and to cater for every woman in every circumstance. In terms of the legislation itself, Minister, there's a couple of things I just want to touch on. One is the three days. Um, it wasn't something that came up in the Oireachtas Committee, um, as Peter and Louise will and Jan will testify. It wasn't something that was part of the committee report. I understand the reasons it was put in, Minister. Um, I, I, you know, some people have said it, it was put in for political reasons. Um, some people have said there was other reasons. But I, I, generally, I understand why it was put in. But I think it's also important, Minister, that it doesn't become a barrier. And I think that's where the debate needs to happen at committee stage. If it's been put in for a very good reason, then let's be confident in those reasons. But I also think, Minister, that the one thing I have learnt during the last number of years, and particularly on the Eighth Amendment Committee, is we need to listen to the medical profession. And if the medical profession have concerns around the three days, whether it's politically acceptable or not, we need to listen to that. And if there is a strong ground swell of support in the medical profession against the three days, then the government needs to be open to that. Because the last thing we want to do is to pass legislation that makes things even more difficult for the medical profession in terms of providing services. So I think we should be open to the three days, um, and I think we need to get a bit of guidance from the profession in relation to the three days. There is no doubt, Minister, in my mind that the three days is going to impact on certain um, sectors of society. For instance, women in direct provision, uh, women with disabilities, uh, women from the regions um, whose only GP may have a conscientious objection to it, um, women who are victims of domestic violence. Um, the three days could prove problematic to them, and as I said, we need to take the guidance in relation to it. The other area I think we should be open uh, to looking at, Minister, during the passage of the legislation is the whole area of uh, risk. The committee was very clear that you cannot categorise risk or you cannot categorise harm. And I know the legislation talks about um, the risk to the life of the woman. It doesn't categorise the risk when it comes to the life of the woman. But in relation to the health of the woman, it does look to categorise it, in my opinion. And I think we need an explanation why you have decided to categorise it, Minister, when all of the evidence that was presented to us before the committee indicated you cannot categorise risk, that that has to be a medical decision based on you know, a medical judgement um, at a particular moment in time based on all of the circumstances. And 
I just think that needs to be looked at, and I hope that you're open to looking at that, Minister. The other area is in relation to um, the ancillary recommendations that were made by the Eighth Amendment Committee. I can completely understand, Minister, why they are not in the primary legislation that is before us tonight. A lot of them will be policy decisions. Um, some of them may not need to be in primary legislation, and some of them may need to be in primary legislation. Some of them may need to be in regulations or secondary legislation. But I think a message needs to go out as well, that the government is not cherry-picking the report, that there is a commitment, not just from the government, but from all parties in this chamber, that we fully intend to implement the ancillary recommendations. And just because it is not in this legislation does not mean it's any less important than the issue which has been debated within the bill. It just means that this is not the appropriate place to put it. But I have no doubt there is no rowing back on the commitment by government in relation to the ancillary recommendations. Uh, and I look forward to working with uh, Peter Boylan, who has been appointed to oversee the um, implementation and the preparation of the services in relation to that. The final point I want to make, Minister, is just in relation to viability, because a number of deputies have has raised it. And again, I would go back to what was discussed in the Oireachtas Committee and even the general scheme of the bill. I don't believe it is for us to put down a time frame in primary legislation. I know we have the 12 weeks, but I'm talking about the viability of the foetus and taking in later stages of pregnancy. I think we need to be guided again by the medical profession in relation to that. And that is an issue which I'm sure is going to be dealt with in regulations, Minister, or even in medical council guidelines. So I think, you know, while some people have some concerns in relation to that, I think they're unfounded. And I think as we discuss the legislation and we tease out all of these issues through committee and report stage, that will become more apparent. Um, the very last thing I'm going to say, Minister, is in relation to a number of deputies who spoke tonight who complained about not having enough time to discuss what was in the bill. Now, there is no guillotine on this, to the best of my knowledge, and there is no guillotine going to be put on this legislation. And while we all want it, well, maybe not all, but the vast majority of us want to pass it as quickly as possible. We want to do so in a responsible manner as well, and we want to debate what's contained in the legislation. We want to be able to look at the amendments and debate them and have enough time to debate them. But for some, for some deputies to try and give an impression that there is not enough time to debate, even at second stage, I think is being disingenuous. Because some of those deputies had the opportunity to take a full 20-minute slot tonight and got up and complained that they only had five minutes to speak. There is nobody restricted to five minutes in this chamber. Everyone, to the best of my knowledge, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, had the opportunity to take a full 20-minute slot, as I have tonight, and has... Well, uh, well, uh, well if, I, if I'm wrong, then I'd like to know who has prevented any deputy in this chamber from taking a full 20-minute slot, because the minister has confirmed there is no guillotine. To conclude. Um, so... If I'm wrong, then maybe, Peter, you need to look at whoever told you that and uh, correct them, because everyone, everyone... Excuse, excuse, excuse me. me now, I haven't Finish. interrupted are you, anyone. Are you finished that? I, I, would you please address your remarks to the Chair? And would you what, please what, conclude? What I have yeah, said... Deputy, what, what, conclude. <laughs> conclude your remarks. Sir, there is no need for the interruptions Absolutely. either. Absolutely. OK? Deputy Fitzpatrick, would the you please allow is, the deputy to conclude? The fact, the, fact, of order. the fact is there is no guillotine on this legislation. The, the, excuse me. The facts 
because you want facts, Peter, so please listen to them. But please listen to them. There is no guillotine on this legislation. Please let the deputy continue. There is no guillotine on this legislation, and there were 20-minute slots which were available to every speaker in this House if they so wished to take it up. That is a fact. If you have been told differently, take it up with your whip, if you have a whip. Your time has concluded, Deputy. Thank you.